So welcome everybody uh, to the Sustainability Forum and also um, to the Weston Roundtable. Weston Roundtable is part of a weekly lecture series, which is a public lecture series and a, a credit class. And it is made possible by a generous donation of Roy Weston, who is an alumnus of civil and environmental engineering here at UW-Madison. Um, the Weston Roundtables are administered by SAGE, the Center for Sustainability and the Global Environment, which is part of the Nelson Institute, and that's where I work. My name is Carol Barford, and I'm the host of the talks every week. Um, the Weston Roundtable is also administered by the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and by the Office of Sustainability. So they're a great partner, and this is definitely a joint effort here today in terms of the, the talk. Um, Mr. Weston's intention was to sponsor community research and teaching in sustainability science, technology, and policy, which is pretty broad, so we enjoy a really wide range of speakers um, in our series. Uh, the talks are all recorded, so if you miss anything, you can um, hear it again on the recording, and those, the links to the recordings are found through SAGE's website. Um, so if you go to sage.wisc.edu, you can find all the recordings through the Weston link. So that's about our series of talks. Um, students, if you're in the class, please don't forget to sign in today to get credit for being at today's lecture. But now, the, the good part, the fun part, is that we have a very special speaker here today. Thanks very much to Kathy Middlecamp, who's the education coordinator at the Office of Sustainability um, for bringing the special guest to us all the way from the UK. Uh, Mike Berners-Lee is our guest. He's a leading expert on carbon emissions and also the founder and principal of Small World, Small World Consulting, which helps both private and public organizations to manage their carbon footprint impacts. Um, in this capacity, he's worked with organizations such as the National Trust, BT, British Gas, Booth supermarkets and many smaller companies and also municipalities. In addition, uh, Mr. Berners-Lee conducts sustainability research across several departments at Lancaster University and he's written two books. One is called, um, oh, Bananas, <laughs> forget the whole rest of it. How bad are bananas? The carbon footprint of everything. And also um, the book that he's going to talk to us about today, The Burning Question, um, Mr. Berners-Lee has been on campus for a couple days and been kept very busy talking to students and groups here. Um, we're looking forward very much to this keynote talk. Please welcome Mike Berners-Lee. Okay, well, thanks very much, and it's, um, it's great to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk mainly um, from about this book, which I co-wrote with Duncan Clark, um, and we, it came out uh, about 18 months ago uh, or so. When we wrote it, it's, th it's trying to be a big picture take on climate change, and we wrote it out of the sense that if you really stood back from the question of climate change, if you stood back as if you were right back, further back than uh, most politicians or most, uh, even most academics or most people who get engaged in the climate change um, field, stand, you, you get to see some things that are, uh, in one sense, really simple, and in another sense, we found ourselves thinking, actually, you know, this isn't finding its way into the, into the debate properly yet. And they were so important that we felt that it wasn't possible to respond sensibly to climate change without um, getting your heads around these things. So the book was, an was uh, our attempt to um, lay out the big picture on climate change. And um, we rest... Okay, like that. So we wrestled with the title quite a bit. We talked about calling it The View from Mars, because it was this kind of standing back big picture. And the, the second uh, working title was The Curve. And the reason for that um, is because the first big thing we wanted to talk about was, was this curve. Now, don't worry, this isn't a maths lesson, but this is a, that's a picture of an exponential curve there. And an exponential curve um, has a constant proportional growth rate. And the one I put up there on the on the board has got actually this, that particular one grows at 1.8 percent per year and uh, it's been doing so for at least 160 years and the thing about an exponential curve is that over a set period of time the steepness doubles and the area underneath it doubles and the height of it doubles and for that particular curve it takes 39 years for those things to double 
and the significance of that will, will become clear in a second. And I'm just going to fit to it, exactly onto that curve, I'm going to fit uh, human uh, emissions from fossil fuel use plus land use change. And the reason I've combined those two is because that's the, that's the closest measure we've got for, fossil, for carbon dioxide emissions from human energy use. And if you, you can put other metrics onto that curve, you can put greenhouse gas emissions and you get a broadly similar shape, but you don't get quite the same mathematical fit. But if you, if, and the statisticians of, at, um, at uh, Lancaster University have crawled all over this, and thanks to Andy Jarvis at Lancaster for first pointing this out to me with his paper in Nature Climate Change. Um, that doesn't just look as though it's quite a good fit to exponential. It really is, mathematically, a, a far too close a fit to be a coincidence. And you can see that there are one or two little bits of deviation. So we, 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 we went underneath the curve for a little while there, while we had a couple of world wars and a Great Depression. But we bounced back again we, uh, by finding a whole load of uh, oil fields in the Middle East and things like that. And then we had a bit of, a, bit of an oil crisis here with some OPEC stuff cartels and so on, but it's okay, we're bouncing back again from it. Um, so we've sort of, we've had some temporary small deviations from exponential, but nothing really to speak about. And you might say, well, hang on a minute, the last few years, surely, you know, there's been so much talk about climate change, there's been, there's been world summits, there's been countries um, setting targets and countries like mine have been meeting targets to cut their emissions and there are probably plenty of people in this room who do things personally to cut their carbon. Surely some of that has rubbed off. We must see some kind of dent. Well, a few years aren't that, aren't that statistically significant, but for what it's worth, no, there's no, no trace whatsoever in the recent data to suggest that humankind has done anything whatsoever to dent that rising 1.8% per year emissions curve. Um, not a job, just so we're clear about that. So what does this curve tell us? So it, it doubles about every 39 years, and no detectable change at all from business as usual. And efficiency in green energy clearly haven't helped us at all yet. If you think about it, I mean, it's a bit counterintuitive, but if you think about it, back in 1860, um, if we wanted to be seen if we wanted to be in a room together after the sun had gone down, we'd have to be burning something in that room, either gas or a candle or something, in order to be able to see each other's faces. Now we've got LED light bulbs. I don't know if they're LEDs, but you know, we, we can do light about 500 times more efficiently now. And if you think of information storage, you know, we used, 160 years ago we had to write something down if we wanted to store information. Now we can store it millions of times more efficiently digitally. But you know what? Our, the carbon footprint of both our information storage and our lighting it's actually gone up. Even per capita, it's gone up. So somehow efficiency hasn't led to a reduction in, in, uh, in total emissions. It's gone hand in hand with that very steady growth um, in emissions. And green energy, you know, we talk about green energy a lot as well. And um, clearly that hasn't, that hasn't brought about that, that dent either. And the last thing that uh, the exponential nature of that curve is very strongly suggestive of is a, f a feedback mechanism at the global system level, at a, at a very fundamental level. So you get exponentials occurring naturally all the, all the time in all sorts of situations. If you have an island that's got no foxes on it but lots of rabbits and you introduce foxes to it, you know, the population of the foxes goes up exponentially as long as the rabbit population keeps up. Um, because the more foxes there are, the more they can breed and the faster they can grow. And if you get into debt on your bank account, if you don't do anything about it, and if your bank doesn't do anything about it, the debt, that, that debt will grow exponentially because the more there is, the more the interest on it will grow. So there's something about this that's very strongly suggestive that energy is begetting energy. And, that, and that's the way the dynamic goes. But the good news about exponentials is that they all come to an end eventually. You know, maybe the, fox will eat, the foxes will eat the last rabbit, and uh, you know, at that point the, the population of the foxes will, will crash. Or maybe they'll reach some happy equilibrium with the rabbits, and your bank manager will get in touch with you at some point. So all exponentials come to an end. So the question we've got to ask is, in terms of our exponential emissions, is this one going to come to an end in a way that is uh, going to be benign for us and we're going to be happy with? 
what's the, what's the mechanism by which it's going to come to an end? And or do we have to actually intervene and deliberately make it come to an end in a certain way? Or can we just carry on as normal and let it do its own thing and it'll, it'll be fine? So let's have a look. Um, so I'm not going to go deeply into the science of this, but two degrees centigrade has been kind of put as a, uh, acknowledged by just about every country in the world as a temperature that we don't want to, uh, we don't want to go above. And uh, the original science behind this back in the late 90s, this is a, from a paper that the IPCC took a lot of interest in um, back in the late 90s. Uh, and it was really the reason for how that stake in the ground of two degrees came about. The original, this is two degrees here above pre-industrial levels. And here are a load of different types of risks and the ones to pay most attention to are this one and this one. This is kind of... Um, Aggregate impact, so this is uh, more or less if you add up all the different risks together and put them in one pot, how risky does it look? And this is the risk of large-scale discontinuities. That's the risk that we might push the climate to a point where it's sudden, you su we suddenly incur some abrupt and catastrophic change that the climate is going to flip into some different state that might be much more, um, much more difficult for humans uh, to live with. So these are the two we want to keep the... the closest eye on, that's the line there, that's the two degrees stake in the ground, and you can see that you know, we're mainly in the white, it's not too risky. And that was the logic behind it, let's not go above two degrees. Okay, the same people who did this uh, came back to it um, in 2009, around the same time as Copenhagen, but not in time to get into the Copenhagen talks. And they applied the same methodology, uh, but they used more up-to-date models, better models, and more up-to-date and better data. And what I showed you before is here, and what they came up with the next time round was here. So there's your two degree line, and you can see we're way into the yellow there. So we don't know that two degrees would be a disaster. We don't know that we can get away with two degrees. We might get away with going worse than two degrees, um, but we don't want to play around with it, that's for sure. So let's stick with two degrees for the sake of, for the sake of argument. We don't want to go higher. And then the best science on on climate change, what causes what, says that it's a, as a pretty good approximation, um, we can, what matters most is the cumulative emissions to date. That's the area underneath the curve that I keep showing you. That's the sum total of all the carbon that's been emitted. And it's a pretty, um, more or less, it's a pretty exact number. It turns out that two degrees more or less ties up with a trillion tons of carbon, or 3.66 times that much in carbon dioxide. So. That means, on that basis, and this, this chart actually is directly from the book, so it's a couple of years old now, but at that time, that was cumulative emissions to date, 2000, about 2,000 billion tonnes, so a bit more than that, it's about, two, about 2,100 now or something. Um, and that's how much we've got left to burn if we're prepared to put up with a 50% chance of 2 degrees, but if we want a 75% chance of staying within 2 degrees, we've got that much left to burn. And that number is now 600, not 700, and that's now 1,500, not 1,600, because things are changing fast. And I said that the area under that curve was doubling every 39 years. So it takes us 39 years to put another blob this size out there, and another 39 years after that, we'll add another two on top of that to there, so we'll have four blobs like that. So, you know, we, this um, is how fast we're going to run into a problem is, is, you know, it's coming up quick. This is a cumulative emissions curve. I just thought I'd quickly show you. So this is, I showed you a curve of annual emissions. Now I'm going to show you what cumulative emissions are like, and they're, they're exponential as well. The actual emissions are in red there. The mathematical exponential curve that I fitted it to are in blue, and you can see you can hardly detect the difference between the two. And there's the trillion, I've gone back to carbon, not carbon dioxide. There's the trillion dollar stake in the ground for two degrees, and we'll fly through that in about 2045. And if we, if we carry on as we are on the exponential, we'll fly through, the rough, rough, very roughly speaking, 2 trillion tons is 4 degrees. And we'll fly through that about another 39 years later. And we don't know what 4 degrees will be like. Nobody knows what 4 degrees are like. But it's, uh, there's a lot of evidence to say that it's very likely to be very nasty for us. 
So we better come off the curve. If we want to stay within a 75% chance, that's what we need to do. So this is slightly stylized, but this is the curve we've been on, and it would need to look like that. So let's say, okay, that looks unrealistic. Actually, that say today, that was two years ago, that today. So uh, let's have a look at what if we're prepared to put up... That's for a, sorry, that's for a 75% chance of staying within two degrees. Let's say we're prepared to put up with a 50-50. Then it can look like that, which means we work like crazy to peak global emissions by about 2020, and then we come down steeply from that. And that might give us a 75% chance. Well, maybe, we'll, maybe, we don't need to in, maybe we still don't need to intervene deliberately. Maybe we'll run out of fuel, because people talk about peak fuel. They used to talk a lot more about peak fuel. Actually, they're talking about it less now. So let's see if we'll just run out in time. Because maybe that will stop us having to do anything about it. So this is, um, this is the proven reserves. By proven reserves, I mean that the oil, coal, and gas companies are 95% certain that they can... Uh, they can sell them at today's market prices at a profit. So they're on the books as they're basically banking on digging it out of the ground and selling it at a profit. And these numbers change all the time. It's hard to be exact on it, but it, they grow all the time, actually, because we're finding new fuels, and as you know, we're finding new ways of getting it out of the ground, and there's tar sands and fracking and all that stuff, uh, and there's the Arctic and so on. So we're actually building other, uh, those um, those. We're discovering new, fuel, new sources of fuel all the time, and we're getting better at getting it out of the ground. So we're growing that. So for a 50-50 chance, we could, we could burn about half of it, but that's only the proven reserves. What about if you look at all the recoverable resources? That's the stuff that we've discovered. We know how to get it out of the ground already with existing technologies, but it may not necessarily be profitable. Well. That's how much there is, and that's how much of it we can burn. So we need, to, we need to leave the vast majority of fossil fuel in the ground. And we can debate exactly what proportions, and sometimes you'll hear two-thirds uh, needs to stay in the ground, and, and it's, you know, it's, but it's two-thirds of what? Two-thirds of the recoverable resources? Well, it's usually two-thirds of the proven resources. It's the kind of latest figure that I, I, I read most about. But it's those kinds of numbers. So we've got to keep it in the ground. And it won't happen by accident. And this is, all this stuff I've said so far is actually really clear. It's, um, when Duncan and I wrote the book, it felt like it wasn't in sort of common language, but it really is now in the UK. That's changed. I mean, it's, people are talking a lot about the need to, to leave the fuel in the ground, and it's pretty well uncontested by people who get climate change in, in, any, in any way at all. If you're not a denier, it's uncontested, really. So if it's so clear, why can't we do it? Why can't we stop taking it out of the ground? Surely it's obvious, right? So let's have a look at the reasons. So the first thing is the value of those reserves. It's very hard to estimate the value of the reserves and the infrastructure that is reliant on using up those reserves, the power stations and the cars and all the rest. Of it. It's very hard to put a hard number on it, but it's somewhere in the 20 to trillion dollar, um, uh, 20 to 50 trillion dollar mark. So for perspective, that's um, 20. Uh, the UK GDP is about $2 trillion. What's, what's US GDP, roughly? Uh, anyone got that? Figure off the top of their head? That's probably about 10 times what ours is, something like that. But it's up, so there's a lot of money there. So that's one reason. Because if we leave that fuel in the ground, then the value of those reserves is going to have to be written off. And this is the investment in developing new reserves. So that's getting those big stacks that I showed you just now in the previous slides and making them higher. This is how much money we're putting into that. So it's a much smaller figure, but it's still a very big figure. That's uh, 2012 investment in developing new reserves. And I'm going to show you a much smaller figure again, but it's still a pretty large number. And this is just for the US, this one. One billion dollars the fossil fuel companies and related industries spend on lobbying and political donations to outfits like the Heartland Institute or whatever that are trying to, that are pushing this idea that climate change, slowing down the climate change debate, pushing the idea that it either doesn't exist or we don't need to worry about it or whatever. So all these pretty serious reasons why we haven't got on top of the, uh, the problem yet. So what about renewables? Because some people say, you know, surely all the renewables that we can see around the place, they must be helping them. And uh, what can we expect from them in the future? Because, well, maybe they'll, um, 
maybe they'll save the day for us. We can just grow the, the renewables so fast that no one will care about fossil fuels anymore and they'll just stay there. Let's have a look. So this is the last, between 2000 and 2011, this is just a chart showing the additional energy capacity. So what we had additionally compared in 2011 compared to in 2000. So we had that much additional energy from coal, that much from gas, that much from oil, and that much from renewables. So that tells us two things. One is the growth in renewables was dwarfed by what was going on in the other fuels. But also that they didn't, the renewables didn't replace, there's no evidence that the renewables replaced anything. The renewables didn't replace the other fuels, they just happened as well as the other fuels. And let's have a look at some more evidence that that would be the default position. So this is a, a chart of our use of different fossil fuels over the last um, 160 years. So I haven't got biofuels in here, which um, really just trickle along in their own sweet way, more or less not going up or down. But this is coal coming along here in yellow. And, on top, and when it happened, it didn't stop the biofuels. It just happened on top of the biofuels. And about here, oil started coming on the scene. And it didn't stop coal growth. It happened on top of the coal growth. It might have dented the trajectory in the coal growth a bit, but they were both going up together. And then along here we had gas starting to come along, on top of the, uh, the growth in the other two. And here we've got nuclear happening on top of the growth in the other two, uh, with its own story for why it's, why it's tailed off a bit. And if you look very carefully, you can just make out a green line along the bottom, and that's renewables. So what we're saying about renewables, if we think renewables are going to save, it, save the day for us, is two things. One is, this is going to fly up there and go right up into the rafters by about here. And I'm not saying that's impossible. It could happen. We could have very, very rapid growth in renewables if we put our minds to it. But that wouldn't be enough. It's going to have to, it's going to, have to happen in such a way that these guys... Not necessarily this one, but these three here are going to have to be pinned to the floor. And there's nothing to suggest that just pushing the renewables up on its own is going to pin the others to the floor. In fact, if you look at that exponential curve, it looks as though energy begets energy. So the more energy we've got, the more energy we want. And it might even be the case that if you put up a wind turbine without constraining the fossil fuel, then our human appetite for fossil fuel, uh, human appetite for energy might go up by just a shade more than one wind turbine's worth. In which case, appetite for fossil fuel might slightly weirdly go up a little bit the more wind turbines you have unless you, cons unless you constrain the fossil fuel. But what about is innovation and efficiency and national targets and personal carbon cutting? You know, why haven't they helped at all? Because that's quite a hard reality to look at. They really haven't helped one bit and that's just fact. You know, the evidence is it's, that's not something you can contest at all. And the trouble is, it all boils down to this balloon squeezing effect. So my country sets some targets, and it's keeping them very nicely. Its emissions are going down um, on, a, on a production basis. But if you, look at, if you look at it on a consumption basis, they're still going up. And that's because we're getting our, uh, more and more of our emissions done in places, are going on in places like China. They're doing our manufacturing for us. Um, so it's an example of this rebound effect. And individual savings, you know, if you cut your carbon footprint by, let's say, not, not going on a plane, and I hold my hand up, I went on a plane this week, and I'm going to do it again this week as well. But um, if I don't go on that plane, will that save that much carbon, or will somebody else take the plane ticket? Or if someone else doesn't take the plane ticket, will the, air, will the airline adjust its marketing in some way and find a way of getting someone else in the end to take the plane ticket? Or will they sell the fossil fuel to someone else somehow? find a different market for that. Unless I can track it back to the fuel staying in the ground, then I haven't made a difference, which is kind of quite disconcerting. And there's, there's a rebound effect on lots and lots of, on just about any micro action uh, you can think of. And the evidence is that, if you look at that exponential curve, the evidence is that, that this, you know, it's, it's, the global system is incredibly resilient to any piecemeal effort that we throw at it to try and um, curve it. So we're going to have to do something very fundamental at the global system level if we want to dent that curve. And here's another way of looking at things, which is there's three ways you can add up the carbon emissions. You can add them all up by, at the point of extraction. That would be here, this carriage here. Or you can add them up at the point of burning, and that's the most common one that people do. That's 
that's the usual way that emissions are, are added up. Or you can add them up at the point of consumption, the carbon footprint of everything that we buy and do. We'll work out all our carbon footprints, 7 billion people's carbon footprints, and we'll get the same number. Uh, so this like three carriages of a train. They're all going along at exactly the same speed. You cannot slow one of them down without slowing them all down. Uh, or unless you slow them all down, you won't succeed because they're quite capable of pulling each other along. There's strong coupling between them. There's, you know, there's companies manufacturing stuff and persuading us that we need to have higher consumption, we need to buy it. And there's fossil fuel companies uh, very skilled at making sure they've got a market. So unless we're working on all three of those carriages, you know, they will slow down together or they won't slow down at all. And some people say, well, maybe it's all down to population. Maybe this exponential growth is all down to population change. So the next slide I'm going to show you is... I um, know. Oh there's uh, just a simple equation that you can, you can write. It's just a truism to say that total emissions equals population times GDP per person times energy per GDP times carbon per unit energy. That's just a piece of, um, piece of maths called the Kaya identity. You can't really argue with it. So let's have a look at how the growth of recent decades has split out. And this next slide comes from the latest IPCC reports. Um, we've got stuff about this in our book, but this is a nice one slide way of summing it up. So this is, a looking, this is looking at where the growth in emissions, and the IPC describes it as what's been driving it. And I, I wouldn't make that causal link in the, in the way that they do. But in this decade here, you can see that population grow, grew by, the population part of it grew by this much because uh, and you could attribute that much growth to that. And then here's the GDP per capita, so we got richer, or the world got richer. But that was offset somewhat by the energy intensity of GDP, so we, we decarbonized the way that we make money uh, a little bit. And we had also decarbonized the way we, do en the way we create energy a little bit. We'd, our energy sources have become a little bit cleaner. And broadly speaking, that trend has continued for a long time, and here are three decades of it. And last decade was a little bit different because actually the carbon intensity of the world's energy supply got worse, not better. So for all we hear about renewables and everything, that was more than offset by the growth in coal last year. Uh, sorry, last decade. So, so there we have it. And, but, um, and the interesting thing about these four components, population, um, GDP per capita, uh, energy per GDP, and carbon per unit energy, is that none of them follow an extra exponential trajectory. They all follow different kind of pathways. It's only when you multiply them together that you get this weirdly exponential thing. So if you push one of them down, if you push the population down, say we were to hold the population steady, and you can do this in country, and you can look at this on a country by country basis, what you find is that the point at which the population growth tails off is exactly the point at which the impact per, per person steepens to compensate. So you've got an interaction between these to keep us on the exponential. Just, I'm just going to do a quick diversion into, into food and land. So, for, so far I've only talked about fossil fuel, but we can't have a climate change debate without, without look, having a quick look at, fossil, at, um, at food and land, because it's integral to the whole question. So here we go. So This is just a quick take, and anyone who was here this morning will have, will have seen me go through this. Okay, uh, so this is, I hope you can read the writing. Uh, this is the world's uh, food production. So we grow food, enough food for 6,000 calories per person grown globally a day. That's great. It's about three times what we need. It's, uh, this world is a total land of plenty. Um, so that's fantastic news. Let's see what happens to it. Well... About 4,600 is edible crop harvest. About 900 gets left in the ground. It just gets left to rot in the fields. The supermarkets who ordered it decided they don't want it anymore or it's not quite the right shape or something like that. Um, so it gets wasted. And about 500 gets turned into biofuels, which isn't bad. Um, that's good. It gives us a source of energy instead of fossil fuels, but we need to keep an eye on it because the only way it can grow is at the expense of the, of, of the other two. Okay, and what happens to that 4,600? Well, 
About 600 goes to post-harvest waste. That's mainly a developing country uh, problem. That that's often boils down to simple things like lack of a, a plastic box to put things in. So that's the kind of problem we, you know, we could, with a bit of organisation and, and a bit of a will, we could sort that one out. Um, and 2,300 is left for crops for human food, and 1,700 gets fed to animals. And uh, we have to pump a whole load of grassland into that as well, some of which could be used for human food production. Um, and those animals do crazy inefficient things like walking around and keeping warm. And so that's a source of uh, 1,200 getting lost there. But we get a bit of it back into the human food system. 500 goes back into the human food system. These are just rough numbers. And that would be plenty, except for the fact that another 800 gets but to mainly household waste, that's, um, and, but also processing in there as well. But most of that 800 is household waste in, de in developing countries like the UK and the US. Oh, sorry, developed countries like the UK and the US. And that leaves 2,000 left to be eaten by humans, which would be just enough if we shared it around properly, which we don't, so some people um, end up going hungry. So that's the food system at the moment, and the things I want to point out are this. If we constrain the fossil fuel, which we need to do, and we, we decide that biofuels are going to be the solution, and we let market forces do their thing, then the price of these biofuels is going to go flying up, and there's going to be a lot of farmers who aren't going to want to grow food anymore, they're just going to want to grow biofuels, and if we're not very careful with that, uh, there are going to be people going hungry. But on the other hand, if we manage this properly, God, we can grow, we, even with population growth, we can push that number up through smarter agriculture, even whilst we push up the biodiversity, if we're smart about it. Um, we can change the amount that's going to animals. The trend is going all the wrong way. Meat, meat consumption is going up, and that's because developing countries are trying to follow people like us, because they all aspire to our lifestyles, and they see us eating meat, so that's, that's what you do. That's, that's what you do if you're a rich enough person. Um, so there's status attached to it and pe people are desiring and all sorts of things and we have to show something different because if we could get that number to go down we could really improve the situation and we could definitely sort this one out where we're wasting it and we could stop losing it in the ground and we could stop the post-harvest waste. So there's plenty to play for there and there's new technologies on food production as well um, to help us along. But against that we've got potentially land getting uh, less fertile from climate change and we've got a growing population. So there's a whole kind of equation here which we've got to get on top of. So just to kind of sum up where we've got to, there's that exponential curve and there's the two degrees that we've got to stay within and that's what we need to do to stay within it and that's how much fuel there is in, in the ground compared to how much we can burn and piecemeal actions don't help because of that balloon squeezing effect and renewables, if we grow them, we can't expect them by default to save the day for us because there's no evidence that they'll be instead of the fossil fuels. And there's a whole questions about the land and food system that we need to get on top of. By the way, those biofuels that I was talking about are about the only way that we'll be able to fly in a, in a really low carbon world because we don't yet have any idea how to get an aeroplane up in the sky properly without a liquid, um, without a liquid fuel. So all this is really, really clear, all this stuff. And the book's been out for about a year and a half so far, and there's been no serious contestation of, of any of it. And lots of it's quite similar to IPCC reports that came out. It's not surprising because we use the same data sources. So all this, is, you know, it really is, it's, you know, it's clear. I'm not, this isn't just a thought piece. This is pretty much as close to fact as anything gets. Um, so it leads us to wonder, you know, maybe the real heart of this whole climate change question is, you know, why has the evidence been ignored for so long? Maybe this is the most interesting question about the whole climate change, um, you know, fascinating phenomenon, is, is this human psychology thing. Because all that has been happening. And one way of looking at it is just to say, well, the global brain has not been working properly. You know, there's been a breakdown between rational analysis and action. It's just been a disconnect. It's been like a, mem uh, like a mental illness, you could, you, could, you could say. But it's more of a psychological puzzle, arguably, than, than a rational problem. So what are we going to do about that? So, you know, some explanations for why we haven't... Been, it's too complex. You know, we're not used to dealing with things that are so complex. It's too abstract. This invisible gas that we're expected to not just understand at the cerebral level, we're supposed to get, uh, uh, get emotionally 
passionate about it. And it's too far in the future. Actually, it's less far in the future. You know, it's increasingly not feeling so far in the future. But it's much further in the future than we usually, than we usually, um, than we usually pay too much attention to. There's this optimism bias thing. So um, there's a guy in the UK, Nigel Lawson, uh, ex-Chancellor of the Exchequer, one of the things he says, you know, we'll be fine because oh, humans have always been fine. We've always got away with everything so far, so we'll get away with this one. And actually, every being that's ever existed on the planet could always say that about its species until that species got extinct. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a non-thing to say. But you know, we all think things are going to be a bit better. On average, most people think their kids are going to be brighter than average. Most people think they're going to be living longer than average. Most people think they're going to be more likely than average to win the lottery. That's just kind of how we think there's a good and a bad side to that. And there's confirmation bias. Once we think something, we, we tend to kind of find the evidence around us to, to support that. And it's a bigger than self problem, you know. We have to care we have to start tuning into caring about people on the other side of the world who will never meet the seven billion people. And uh, not just our friends and neighbours and people who are gonna shake us by the hand and say, God, thanks very much for doing that. You know, we have action on climate change uh, requires caring about seven billion people. Well, we're not that good at that yet. And there's a lot of vested interest as I've been talking about. Interestingly, there's vested interest for a low carbon world that hasn't properly been worked up yet. There's a lot of business interest. A lot of businesses would really, really thrive in a low-carbon world, and I, I work with a few of them who are just getting their heads around that. And it's very comfortable, feeling very comfortable at the moment to carry on. And the social inertia. If the fire alarm goes off now, we won't all run out the room. We'll all look around to see if anyone else is running, that, is running out of the room. And that's kind of that's, uh, that's the way that humans are. The good news about that is, if some of us do start running out of the room, we'll all start doing it. And climate change has been a bit like that. And there's been a lack of alternative vision. And some people just say that our species isn't up to it. We're just too much of a rubbish species to deal with a problem like this. But I think the, the evidence actually is against that. If you look at the neuroscience and you look at human history and you look at how fast we can transform the way our brains are wired, actually the evidence is if we get our heads onto it, we can, we can change pr our perspective pretty quickly. Okay, so that's the whole uh, summing up of the picture. How am I doing on time? I'll, I'll whistle through the last few sides. So what I, one thing I want to say to you guys, and I said this to British Gas, or one of our big fossil fuel companies, I said this to the top team there, and they, they bought into it, is that you know, the evidence I've shown you now, uh, I don't think it really is contestable. And uh, once you've seen it, it's like going through a gate. You can't, I hate to break this to you, you can't ever not know this now. You can't ever sit in a room with people who've been in this because you can't ever, any of you, not know what you've just heard. Um, and once you know it, you, you, can't, you can't go back to it. So that's it. He's stuck with it. Uh, um, so the question is, what next? Well, I said about this big global dynamic that we have to break at a very fundamental level. And there's no getting around this. We've got to have a global deal to leave the fuel in the ground. It's got to be a, it's got to be a really good leak-proof deal, or more or less leak-proof deal, and it's got to be strong enough about how much fuel we leave in the ground. And it doesn't matter how hard you think that is to achieve, we have to have it. So more burning questions that kind of come out of the book and we discuss, but we don't bottom out. You know, so how can we wake each other up? Is a, is a, it's critical. And how can we improve our... Out. It's a typo. Uh, how can we improve our media? Um, so we, you know, we, that with, in the UK at least, and I bet it's the case over here, and with, there's been a lot of confusion coming out of the media about what is the science and what do we really need to do and, and stuff like that. And actually, we could demand the, the straight facts um, much more clearly. Maybe we need a more equal world. Maybe, we, maybe we've always put up with having a very unequal world, and maybe that won't do anymore, because if we're going to constrain the fossil fuel, then we've got a huge question about how we're going to share out a limited pot. And we're going to have to agree how to share out a limited pot. And maybe that's going to force us into more equality. Maybe. I don't know. I'm now moving on from the stuff that I can say is fact to the stuff that I'm speculating about. Oop. Um, this whole question of what's the role of microactions in such a global system, because it's clear that at face value, some personal actions don't do any good. But on the other hand, how do they, the question, the real question is how can my personal actions help to create the conditions under which the world can agree to leave the fuel in the ground? Which is a slightly different question. There's plenty we can do. Microactions do matter, but it's how you do them as much as, um, as, much as what they are. 
the growth debate, the economic growth debate, is growth the root of all evil? Some people are saying that it is. We can't have growth uh, getting on top of climate change. Some people say we can, but there are questions around it. And it seems pretty clear that we, maybe we're going to need some new metrics, either instead of growth or on top of growth, that we get really into. And how much cultural shift is required? You know, how much do we need to change in our culture? And how much can we get on top of climate change without changing that? These are all questions that I'm not going to try and bottom out. Bottom out, but it's, it's, it looks like we need to improve the way we think, the way we talk, the way we make decisions. You know, we need to really raise our game if we're going to deal with something as complex and global as climate change. So the, and then the question of what can individuals do? I'm going to um, try and wrap up. I just want to finish on some cause for optimism because I think... Uh, you know, some of the messages I've put out you know, seem, seem to be quite, quite difficult at, for, at face value. But I think there is a real cause for optimism. When Duncan and I wrote this book, we really felt like nobody's listening to a word of this. That feels like it's changing now somewhat. Um, US and China hatching a, hatching a bit of a deal together. Uh, the business opportunity out of a low-carbon world is starting to get seen. The need to leave the fuel in the ground is now widely acknowledged. Um, in the UK, the, part, the three biggest party leaders have just signed a pledge to say, we all think it's really important to stay within two degrees and we're going to really try and make that happen. Well, that is a fantastic stake in the ground to have. Signs of vulnerability in fossil fuels, real vulnerability now from divestment campaigns and so on, and the realisation that it really is going to have to happen. And, uh, and the final point is that tipping points can happen really, really fast. You can have a situation where this whole, the whole system feels unmovable and then you're pushing and pushing and pushing in various different ways and you start to see a few tiny little cracks like the ones I've shown and it can be, if we all push hard, a very short space of time before suddenly the whole landscape changes and we're all thinking differently and the whole politics is changing and the whole thing is spinning on a sixpence and uh, you know, suddenly we're on the case. So that's my, you know, that's my, that's my hope. Uh, I'm going to just finish that for the sake of speed. So thank you for listening. Any questions? Okay. Is that on? Yeah. yeah. So, wonderful, wonderful synthesis. And anybody have questions for Mike? Thank you for your excellent presentation. Michelle Borgognini, Family Practice Physician. Um, I'm interested if you have perspective to offer about Jeffrey Sachs and his work at the Earth Institute, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal Group, and whether you see any optimism there in their work. Well, I think I, I'm not, I don't specifically, you know, I hold my hand up and say I don't specifically know the, the details of that. So, yeah, I guess that's my best answer, really. But I, what I do see, I, I, I kind of see a lot of progressive small things that aren't anywhere near enough, but they are beginning to push us there. So the U.S.-China deal, for example, they, you know, the U.S. and China both need to sign up to about twice what they've currently signed up to. Um, yeah, sorry, I can give you a better answer. Yeah. Just curious if you happen to know a particular number in your plot of emitted tons of a uh, million tons of, of um, CO2 since 1850 or so. What would be the number of million tons in the atmosphere, say in 1850, that this is creeping towards? What percentage are we starting to approach? Any? Oh notion? well, we'd have been down at a baseline level, yeah. which is somewhere around the 280, I think it's, from, it's, I think it's somewhere around the 280 level was the kind of pre-industrial baseline, and we're, we're somewhere up just above the 400 level now, so, and so you're talking about parts per million, right? Uh, you had million, I, I was looking at the graph that was emitted million tons, <coughs> in millions of tons of, oh, of yeah. CO2. Oh yeah, so what was the cumulus of emissions in 1850? So, not Next so much accumulated nothing. emissions, what was in the atmosphere nat natively, we'll say naturally, before we started dumping human extracted carbon back into the atmosphere? Well, there's a background level yeah. that's somewhere around the two-thirds of the, two -thirds of the, about two-thirds of the carbon that's in the atmosphere now was there in pre-industrial times. Thank you. Uh, what 
prospects are hoped you see from the approach of a, say, a revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend plan uh, at a national level and or perhaps globally no negotiated? Um, I kind of, I suppose I, I suppose I feel as though once we, once we get our heads around the idea that the fuel's got to stay in the ground, the mechanic will sort itself out. So I sort of feel as though, you know, that, that kind of, these, one, if, there's, if there's heartfelt commitment to that at climate talks, then, you know, whether it's to do with putting a global price or whether it's to do with putting an absolute, you know, a, a, an absolute limit and having a, a sharing out the point of extraction or, or what, I don't much mind, actually. I'm quite happy to let whole gangs of civil servants around the world thrash out that kind of detail, and that's, you know, that's fine. I'll be, I'll be happy with it. Does that, does that answer it? Well, I, I guess the um, question would be, it sounds like you're saying if, if people kind of get the knowledge into their thick skulls that we have to keep it in the ground, no problem. We'll just figure out some way. And I'm just wondering... Given the different ways that are out there, uh -huh. it seems like a carbon fee and dividend plan or carbon tax would be a way to communicate a signal that everybody understands to do something else, to not burn carbon. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the, 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 the question is, um, the, the big question will be, if we're going to limit the pie, how are we going to share it out? So if you're going to do it on a carbon tax, how's that tax going to go? Is it going to be a, just a straightforward money thing, price per ton of carbon? So that means the rich people can have a certain amount of carbon and the poor people can't have any. Well, that's, you know, that gives you one version of um, you know, the way the wealth gets distributed, the energy wealth gets distributed, and you know, are we prepared to put up with that? Will the world be, whole world be prepared to put up with that? Um, you know, some people are saying, well, the way to, the way to do a carbon tax would be it's per capita, actually. Every person's allowed a certain amount. Well, that would be radically different, you know. So if every American was only allowed the same carbon tax as every African, my goodness, you know, that would change the scene. So, so you know, the whole question of, okay, if you're going to do a carbon tax, on what basis would you do it? And it feeds very strongly into that equality debate. I have a question for you, but I'm also going to call on other people in the audience to help round out the question. Yeah, good. And the, the question that I'm going to come back to you is, have you, I thought I heard you say you've been working with some oil companies, maybe like BP, and I'd be interested in how they're taking this, the people you're working with at the level you're working with, how they're taking the message. But to bring in the audience, this seminar series had a speaker from ExxonMobil uh, recently who was uh, on the team writing their long-term forecast. And what I'm blanking out on, and I hope people remind me or refresh me and, and then, then steer it to you, is I seem to recall that he, he said we need the fossil fuel right now, so he's justifying the current extraction. But then he's saying the trends will turn and eventually will start to reduce. And am I remembering that correctly? Or can others remember that talk and what the ExxonMobil person was saying about the types of challenges that he's raising? And then... Then, if we get somebody from the audience, then if you could respond to what you're hearing from the oil yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah, let's see. Let's see. Anybody, anybody remember that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Take the mic. Okay, so I mean what I'd say about my take on Exxon is that they have really dragged their feet as hard as they can have done on this. Um, my personal experience with um, with the fossil fuel companies. So my most heartening was British Gas. And the MD of British Gas 
residential read the burning question and he said okay he said to Duncan and I right you've got to come and talk to my top team so we went and talked to his top team and I gave them more or less the, the presentation I gave to you that we were also saying you know, reflect, on the, reflect on your kids because your kids will know that, um, that you've seen this evidence and you'll, they will be either thinking or asking you have you, you, know, have you what did you do daddy when you, got on, when you saw that climate change was coming and, and so on and we told them they'd gone through a gate and they couldn't ever sit down together and, and have a discussion, a strategy discussion in which they didn't all know they got this, this stuff and they, in, the, in the room on that day, they completely got it. And then the MD stood up and he said, look, you know, I've been trying, not to, get, I've been trying to avoid this for years, but now we, you know, we can't ignore it any longer. And the question is, how are we going to deal with it? Well, those are all nice words in the room, and I don't actually know the follow-up on what they're doing with it, but it did feel very optimistic to me. And they were finding a pathway. They were saying, you know what, we could be service providers. We're in the business of keeping people warm. Not, uh, not fossil fuel salesmen, and that's very different. That gives us a very different business model, and we can find a pathway through that. You know, that's that's good for us. So that was good. I've also been in situations where I've been presenting, and people from BP and Shell have been presenting. And one in particular springs to mind, in which uh, the person from uh, it's the right way around. The person from Shell did a presentation about. I don't know, all sorts of kind of scenarios and so on that Shell was going to go through. And it all sounded very lovely about how Shell was on the case and all the rest of it. Uh, at face value, you know, it was coming across in that way. That was the kind of flavor and tone of it all. And I was kind of sitting there thinking, God, I'm going to have to contradict all this stuff. And so I stood up and I contradicted all this stuff. And I said, you know, unfortunately, all those scenarios you've put up, we're all going to just fry if that happens. You know, they are all just, you know, they're wild scenarios. And she was in the audience nodding and smiling at me and saying, yeah, yeah, that's fine, as if we were absolutely on the same page. And then we had dinner together later and she was chatting away about how, you know, we were all on the same, pa we were all on the same page with all this. And it was so kind of... I think she'd convinced herself so hard that it took me till after, you know, afterwards to, to realize just how strong that cognitive dissonance was that's going on. And, you know, because she thought, she really thought that she was a sustainability person at, at BP. She really thought she was at Shell. She was, really thought she was on the case with it. And she was saying, oh, yes, and at Shell we get the best brains in the world employed to do our thinking for us, and you must come and talk to them and all the rest of it. And I was thinking, these guys are in a thought bubble. You know, they've sort of taught their way into a completely, you know, a cuckoo land over all this that's miles away from where we need to be. And we need to, not, we need to see through it and we need to make sure the world sees we see through it. So I think they've got a long way, you know, there's a lot of uh, very confused thinking. Not all of it deliberate. Some of it deliberate, not all of it deliberate in the fossil fuel companies. Got time for one or two more. Do you have a sense <coughs> of whether emerges, emerging economies like China, which are trying to uh, improve quickly, or progressive economies like Germany will have any impact that's uh, meaningful? Well, I think China will have a very meaningful impact. I, I talked to the chief exec of McKinsey a, a little while ago about this, and I said, come on, yeah, how are we going to get on top of this? And he said, there's two things. It's our kids because they'll get this in a way that we don't. You know, that next generation, will, they'll look at us and they'll just say, what are you doing? You know, and they'll, 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 they'll be a gog at how dopey we were on this. But you know, hopefully they will get it in a way that we don't. Um, but he, then the second thing he said is China. And he told me a really interesting story. He said he had somebody from China get in touch with him uh, and say, look, could you send me the 30 best articles on sustainability? The 50 best articles on sustainability that you've got. And and so he dug around and he came up with about 30 and he sent them off to him. And the guy got back to him in due course and said, look, if anyone ever asks you again, just point them to this, these five and the other ones don't matter. But the point is that this guy was, it was in the run-up to the new um, election of their new president and this guy was standing for it. This guy was in the running for it. And they'd given him months to go out and do his thinking, you know, and that kind of that long-term thinking and what would we do in the UK you know if someone was running to be Prime Minister or something like that, the last thing we do is give them some time out to do some deep thinking so you know that, and they are you know they've got a, you know, a lot of dilemmas on their hands but it looks like you know they really might be instrumental in this yeah you mentioned that you've worked with some um, companies that you think will flourish in a yeah. low carbon um, situation. Can you talk about what, what yeah. sort of companies or industries? Sure. Okay, so the biggest company I work with is BT. It's got a turnover of about uh, 
30 billion dollars and it's telecommunications and it's mainly UK based and they're in the business of efficient utility right so they help so they make it easier for I could be doing this with a video conference and all, all kinds of things like that and um, so that what they're getting their head around is that uh, so I said I said efficiency doesn't get us anywhere but if you, the minute you constrain the carbon the role of efficiency becomes radically different efficiency becomes the means by which we can still do all the things we do today and more right so efficiency becomes a you know an, uncon un an uncontroversial good thing to have and if you're in the business of allowing people to do the things that they want to do in a more efficient way than they currently do at the moment then suddenly you, the world's a playground for you. Everybody wants your services that much more. And BT are getting that at the top level now. So that's an, that's an example for you. And I actually think that, that business case for a low carbon world is at least as strong as the business case against it, which we see so clearly. You know, the fossil fuel companies understand the threat, but I think that that opportunity has yet to be fully, properly grasped across the business world. Yeah. All right. One more. One more. So, so my question piggybacks on what you just said about possibly changing the business incentive towards a different type of energy. And I'm wondering, you know, with the divestment effort and the fact that wind and wind is becoming competitive, solar, you know, the price of solar is dropping dramatically, then in fact investors and you know, businesses will say, you know what? Maybe it's a bad investment. Yeah. Not only should we divest in in, coal, in fossil fuels, but in fact, this tipping point that you talked about, investors might say, this is a bad investment that we could, you know, really crank yeah. up the renewables. No, uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think divestment will get us there on its own. But I think we need to push from lots of different angles, and I think that's a very important angle. So, and the idea that um, to have a university context, so Stanford's been doing a great job saying things like, you know, if we're in the business of extraordinary thinking, then it's just a contradiction of interns to try and be doing extraordinary thinking when we're still investing in fossil fuels. There's a kind of incongruence there, and the brightest people will get it. So if we want to be in, in the business of doing the best thinking, we just have to get out of fossil fuels. Well, that kind of argument is really getting traction now. It's starting to have weight at Lancaster, where I am. I hope it's having weight here. You know, and, you know, that, but I, I don't think that... Um, developing solar panels and stuff, getting the renewables up on, their, on its own, I don't think that will, will, will be enough. I think we need to actually deliberately not invest in the fossil fuels. But it's a market opportunity. So you think um, one way of looking at it is divestment, but one, another way of looking at it is liberating the funds to go and invest in something much more positive. So, so it's really about investing in other things. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, all of you, for your great questions. And thanks very much to Mr. Berners-Lee for an excellent synthesis and also some really sticky uh, graphics that I, I really like very much. Uh, let's give our guests a nice hand. <laughs>